a little poetry for a lovely night. Here's one from James Cavanaugh. It's the opening poem, the title of the book. There are men too gentle to live among wolves who prey upon them with IBM eyes and sell their hearts and guts for martinis at noon. There are men too gentle for a savage world who dream instead of snow and children and Halloween and wonder if the leaves will change their color soon. There are men too gentle to live among wolves who anoint them for burial with greedy claws and murder them for a merchant's profit and gain. There are men too gentle for a corporate world who dream instead of candied apples and ferris wheels and pause to hear the distant whistle of a train. There are men too gentle to live among wolves who devour them with eager appetites and search for other men to prey upon and suck their childhood dry. There are men too gentle for an accountant's world who dream instead of Easter eggs and fragrant grass and search for beauty in the mystery of the sky. There are men too gentle to live among wolves who toss them like a lost and wounded dove. Such gentle men are lonely in a merchant's world unless they have a gentle one to love. Very nice. Well, here's some poetry from Ireland. Uh, not Arthur O'Shaughnessy, who died in 1881. It's an ode. I think he's talking about poets, but he could extend it to include, you know, monks and priests and actors and dancers and just ordinary people. We are the music makers. We are the dreamers of dreams, wandering in by lone sea breakers, sitting by desolate streams. World losers, world forsakers, on whom the pale moon gleams. And yet we are the movers and shakers of the world forever, it seems. With wonderful deathless ditties, we build up the world's great cities, and out of fabulous glory, out of fabulous story, we fashion an empire's glory. One man with a dream at pleasure shall go forth and conquer a crown, and three with a new song's measure can trample an empire down. We in the ages lying in the buried past of the earth, built in a with our singing, and Babel itself with our mirth, and all through them with prophesying to the old of the new world's worth. For each age is a dream that is dying, and the, or one that is coming to birth. Nice. I'd say it's both. Each age is a dream that is dying, and one that is coming to birth. Okay, here's something from Moore. It's for his wife in the plague. She's afraid she'd get the pox and she'd be ugly and he wouldn't love her anymore. So he wrote her this, Believe me, if all those endearing young charms which I gaze on so fondly today were to change by tomorrow and fleet in my arms like fairy gifts fading away, thou would still be adored as this moment thou art. Let thy loveliness fade as it will. And around the dear ruin, each wish of my heart would entwine itself verdantly still. It's not while beauty and youth are thine own, and thy cheeks, cheeks unprofaned by a tear, that the fervent faith of a soul may be known, to which time will, will but make thee more dear. No, the heart that is truly loved never forgets, and truly loves on to the close. As the sunflower turns to her God when he sets the same look which she turned when he rose. We sang it in the sixth grade in the Belcher School in Milton, Massachusetts with Miss Howes. I suppose fidelity is the theme. Uh, here's the last rose of summer, same man, Thomas Moore. He died in six, 1852. It's a little early, but um, it is the last rose of summer left blooming alone. All her lovely companions are faded and gone. No flower of her kindred, no rosebud is nigh to reflect back her blushes and give sigh for sigh. I'll not forget thee, thou lone one, to pine on the stem. Since the lovely are sleeping, go sleep thou with them. Thus kindly I scatter thy leaves o'er the bed where the, thy mates of the garden lie scentless and dead. 
so soon may I follow, when friendships decay, and from love's shining circle the gems drop away, when true hearts lie withered and fond ones are flown, oh, who would inhabit, who would inhabit this bleak world alone? Yeah, you get closer and closer to the end, your, few, your friends get fewer, or at least they've gone on ahead to get ready for you. This, um, 598, our friend Yates, I will arise and go now, go to industry, and a little, in the cabin built there of clay and wattles made, nine bean rows I'll have there, and a hive for the honeybee, and live alone in the bee loud glade, and I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping down, dropping from the veils of morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, noon a purple glow, and evening full of linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always, night and day, I hear Lake Kawada lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on this roadway, this pavement gray, I hear it in the deep heart's core. Well, we all have a Lake Isle of Innisfree. Oh, yeah, here, listen to this. Adam discovers death. The Discovery by Monk Gibbon. Adam, who thought himself immortal still, though cast from Eden, not knowing yet of death, not guessing that what has beginning ends, nor that the life goes also with the breath. Wandering in empty fields one day, pushing the grass aside, finds Abel, slain, his arms thrown out, his head with briars twined, and on the ground beside, a dull red stain. Abel, not time to sleep now? Have you forgot the work upon us put? And standing by his side, he gazes down, thinking he jests, he stirs him with his foot. Silence, no sound at all, a breathless calm. The warm day sighs, its sighing does not last. The grass tops quiver slightly through the grass, a small field mouse, disturbed, goes hurrying past. Then, seized with sudden fear, he flings himself beside the corpse and cries, For your mother's sake, give me an answer. Still, no answer comes, only the cry, Abel, awake, awake. Yeah. And then finally, uh, 693, I see his blood upon the cross, upon the rose. This is from, uh, what's his name? Plunk Plunkett. He was one of the rebels in the uprising at Easter, 1916. They shot him. I see his blood upon the rose, and in the stars the glory of his eyes. His body gleams amid eternal snows, his tears fall from the skies. I see his face in every flower, the thunder and the singing of the birds about his voice. Carved by his power, rocks are his written words. All pathways by his feet are worn. His strong heart stirs the ever-beating sea. His crown of thorns is crowned, trined with every thorn. His cross is every tree. The best line, all pathways by his feet are worn. Yours too. He's been there. Right. Well, let's see. The man told me that lithium helped him with his illness. In fact, he felt fine. Turned out he did have some difficulties. People were next door, were out to get him. They harassed him constantly. I know they do. Turn a corner, there they are. I come out the door, they come out the door. I drive in the driveway, he drives in behind me. He peeks through the curtains. I can see the curtains wiggling. One day it got so bad, I went out and got in the car and shut the doors and locked them and called 911. They came. What's the matter? People next door, they're after me. So the officer went next door and he came back. There's nobody home. Yeah. 
That's the way it always is. <laughs> now, if I could get to know that man, and not only be his friend, but come to love him, so that he would put a complete trust in me, I might be able to tell him, look, some of these messages you're getting aren't quite straight. They've been uh, distorted on the route, you know, to your mind. And if he would listen to me, I could help him. The information you're getting isn't correct. Forty pilots were hired to carry mail in the 1920s when they started their mail. Thirty-one died in crashes. Reason? Flying through clouds, they got disoriented. They'd end up flying sideways, even though they were certain they were flying on the level. And so they go into a turn and then into a spin, and that's it. <clears throat> Kennedy did the same in few just recently. The information his senses deliver him is faulty. The inner ear cannot function in such circumstances. It needs something for orientation. So Tyler's go into a spin and crash. It wasn't until the invention of the gyroscope and the artificial horizon that the situation was met. Then they taught the fly, pilot to fly blind. And it's a very difficult maneuver to teach them to fly blind because they're certain they're flying crooked, sideways, at least as far as their senses go. So he has to trust the instrument. He has to fly blind. A highly trained pilot with 18,000 hours took off in Bombay in the night, beautiful, and drove into the sea with 400 aboard, all killed. He had 18,000 hours experience. He was, they heard him on the tape. Funny, he said, both instruments are out. Of course, he was out. The instruments were correct. But he was certain he wasn't flying flat, straight. More than, yeah, it was 200, not 400. Now, if a mentally ill man could fly blind and listen to his mentor, he could make it. And if the pilot flies blind in a cloudscape or in the dark, he'll make it. You know, Kennedy knew the theory, but he hadn't had enough practice. 